One of my memories of North Northeast Portland along Williams and Vancouver, uh, I had a friend who I went to high school with. We were good friends in high school. His dad owned some property along Williams, uh, the old House of Sounds, a couple other buildings along there. And after high school, he left Portland and uh, only came back when his dad got really sick. And I remember running into him and talking to him and, and he was talking about how he hated Portland and he wanted to just get out of here, wanted to get rid of that property. And I said to him at the time, I was like, man, if you sell this property, this neighborhood's gonna go. Even when I lived in Portland as a teenager, I was too white for the black kids, too black for the white kids, and I just never felt like I fit in. Never wanted to uh, take over the world, just wanted to kick a dent in it. This is my voice, and if you think I'm going to use your voice, you got the wrong person. Rather than trying to create a world that works for me. I wanted to create a world that works for more than me. Well, the majority of the whites in that area were shocked to know that I had gotten into their neighborhood. I'm telling you, when we were little, I'm telling you, downtown Portland, it was, it was racism. And I ended up in Portland initially when I was about 14 years old. My mother moved me and my other seven brothers and sisters to Portland. My dad had passed away unexpectedly and she had gotten a job in Portland. I got turned in to housing because I had a lot of tall black men coming in and out of my apartment, which were my brothers. They just assume that these tall black men were a danger or a threat to them. Everybody I encountered in Camden was black. And so my notion of creating a world that worked was creating a world that works for black people, you know. I, I had a TV, we could watch the TV, and we could see all the white people on TV were having a ball. When I was in grade school, or I think we call it um, junior high school, I had a, an art teacher and I was drawing, I was drawing people, but I was drawing white people. And she said, Arvy, draw the people outside, draw the people out the window there. See those people out there, draw those people. I didn't even know what she was talking about. Well, I went to all black school. <laughs> She's talking about drawing black people. My grandfather gave me a book on Michelangelo. I copied everything in that book. Um, but to me, that was art. That was art. Not those guys out there. This of these white people that I'm drawing, that's art. Um, Miss Brenner said, no, 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 no. Draw those folks. I didn't stay here long because shortly after my mom moved us all to uh, between Sherwood and Newburgh. And so I actually went to high school there. I felt it was like the most racist place because I was the only um, black child in my classroom. Sometimes there was a time when I was the only one in my whole school and they were mean. We were born on uh, Rodney and Fremont on the corner. The house is still there. As a child was Southwest Woods with my mom and my dad and my brothers and sister. Before I moved to Portland, I grew up in the East Coast. I grew up right outside New York City in, uh, in a tiny little suburb in the state of Connecticut. And uh, it was a really, really white town. There was like, I think maybe six black families in the entire town. And of those six, four of them were related to me. A lot of people call me uh, J-Dub, uh, they call me K-Boo, radio man, um, reverend, pastor, um, or uh, to the latter part of this, uh, Shaka. And actually it turned from Shaka to Shaka Groovia, 
community nut from way back. Um, came from San Antonio, Texas. And when you're from Texas, you think big. Uh, I did go to school down the street at Oakley Green mm -hmm. and Jefferson. Um, later, I went to PCC. Um, went to some other college. I went to Grambling. I started school at NYU when I was started my college career at NYU. Uh, right side of the outside of the campus, right outside the door, was jazz clubs. I had to pass by to go to school. <laughs> And I couldn't, and often when I'm supposed to be doing a paper, I'm sitting there listening to McCoy Tanner, Frank Foster, and, and other jazz greats. And I'm supposed to be doing the schoolwork. So I had recognized that I wasn't going to finish school if I didn't get out of here. So at 11 years old, I was one of the co-founders of an organization called the Black People's Unity Movement. And um, as uh, we were doing demonstrations for better housing, et cetera, and uh, at around 11 or 12 years old, we, were ha we had a, a demonstration. We're walk walking down the street, um, and we had a bullhorn encouraging people to come out and join us for better housing, etc. And somebody, one of them, handed the bullhorn to me. And I don't remember what I said, but I could see people three blocks away coming to their doors and looking at what was happening. And based on whatever it was I was saying, I could see them joining our march. That was my first taste of um, people's power. I remember when I was growing up, we, I would come outside and I would hear people marching up and down the street saying, we are the African people. Um, and it was, it was an exhilarating and a beautiful time to just be free and be black. George Page doing jazz, the master blaster. As a matter of fact, and I have to say this, George, God rest you. So he put me on Front Street because he asked me why I didn't play any blues on my show. And I told him, there's no funk in the blues. And B.B. King was coming to town. He said, OK. So he got me these tickets to the B.B. King concert. And uh, him and B.B. were great friends. I was in the second row. And in the middle of the concert, B.B. stopped, started talking to his guitar, Lucille. And he said, Lucille, zoop, zoop. He said, there's some young man, I don't know if he's backstage, front row, that he thinks there's no funk in the blues. And he made this funny sound like, really? With the guitar, like, doo -doo -doo. And he said, can we show him that there's funk in the blues? He said, one, two, three, four. And George Clinton and the mothership landed in the middle <laughs> of the B.B. King concert. That's the only way I can describe it. That band got so funky, so high, and George was uh, stage right laughing at me, going, <laughs> I told you. It was like a musical gumbo in my house all the time. There was always somebody with a something playing or something. Bruce was, and Catone were my drummers at Jeff. I sang in the choir. Um, I was a part of Mount Sinai, Church of God in Christ. Um, where they believed in choir rehearsal for four and five hours. <laughs> in a weird way, I'm actually hyper aware of when there's a lot of black folks around. Because to me, as a kid growing up, it was always a treat. Whenever we went someplace, um, we'd go into New York City. Um, and when I got older, we would go up to Harlem and I would hang out in Harlem all the time. And to me, that was just a great place to be because it was like, there was just something, it was, it was unlike what I was used to, but it was, um, there, there was just a, a tremendous spirit and energy there that, that I loved. When I came to Portland, I was just passing through, and Portland had just won uh, a basketball series. And I said, wow, this is a great place. I'm coming up from Los Angeles. The skies are blue up here. Yeah, it rains in Portland. Absolutely it does, but it makes everything great. And because of that, we have these beautiful flowers and we have these beautiful trees and the air is clean, you know, and it's like you can go a couple of hours, you can be at the ocean, go a couple more hours the other direction, you can be at the mountain. Who wouldn't want that? I saw a terrific opportunity here and I love the, uh, the surrounding environment, the, the, uh, the greenery. And it was sunset, so it had that pink glow. And this is back in the days when you walked out of the airport, you could actually see the mountain, you know. 
I remember the first time I ever seen a snow-capped mountain in my life. And I walked out, I stopped right in the doorway, and I said to her, I said, we can turn right around and go right back and pack our bags, we're coming here. And that was it, that's how I got to Portland. In my time away from Oregon, I had gotten a different perspective. Uh, in Detroit, which is most a predominantly black city, is where I started being comfortable with wearing my hair natural, because they had whole salons where they only did natural hair and they only, there were some that they only did locks, right? And so that is where I got my blogs and I came back to Portland just all full of, you know, my blackness, blackity, blackity, blackness. And so people didn't know how to like take me and, and I didn't care because this was the first time I felt really comfortable with, with how I was representing myself to the world. I came to Portland in 1980 uh, looking for a better life, looking for more uh, uh, safety, actually. In the big city, I'm from, originally from New York. Drugs really had decimated my community. The white people that I encountered in Camden were there to administer to us, okay? So we, um, you know, there were white teachers, there were white police officers, there were white people running the stores, etc. And so we were like the colony, you know, and, and these were like the colonial administrators. So there, there was something fundamentally wrong with that picture. And I could, I could, could sense the wrongness of it before I had words for it. They wanted their property back, so we got a letter from a neo-Nazi threatening to burn us out if we didn't move out. But it's that subtle violence that, that we experience every day um, that, that impedes your learning, impedes your performance. Um, having to think about how you're being perceived, um, having to think about if I make a mistake are they going to lay that on my race? You know, Tim McVeigh can go in and blow up a, a, a federal building. That doesn't stick to white folks. Three, four. Salty eyes burn with decision made plain, stressing off the grave, given, driven by the man mind, kept intact for lack of the facts. Say fable, favor, conception, savor, missed by the mister, got a plan twister, stepping on my color with his left foot. See, he's about to fall, cause he forgot to put his right foot down so he can be stable, let loose the horses with the evil forces in their riding. In the summer, you would have Irvington Park, uh, Woodland Park, we had uh, Peninsula Park. There was something going on at every park. There were um, basketball tournaments and just fun things for kids to do and get together. I mean, it was, it was a delight. There would always be these like random brothers that showed up only in the summertime with big old froze that came from wherever they came from and they would always be playing basketball in the park. Um, we had concerts in the park that were nice. Um, there was like Alberta Park was always popping. We were out at Columbia Park, beautiful day, and I cannot remember what happened, you know, what triggered this, this, this negativity, if you will. Uh, and next thing you knew, the police had surrounded the park and they were driving up in the park and, you know, uh, people got angry and started throwing things and different things and they decided to start arresting people. And they went after this one young man, and I will never forget it. And they thought that they were gonna cut him off with this car. They did not know that he was the state high hurdles champion. And man, now I'm gonna tell you this, Blake Griffin don't have nothing on this day. Blake jumped over a car in the NBA dunk contest, but on this day, hurdled that car in full stride and disappeared into the sunset. He didn't even go back to his own car. He just kept running. And the whole park just kind of busted out laughing. It was, it was so funny. And at that point, people just began to naturally disperse. But that was one of the craziest days in the park. This, this uh, disconnect between 
what I was experiencing and uh, what I could see on television, it began to cre get, get a name for itself. And um, this became uh, the, the, the black movement. Um, and I was very uh, much affected by that in a uh, at a very early stage. There was a woman that came to one of the schools when I went to King, when I was going to King, that was coming and teaching a lot of different, like, African languages and garb. And so I wanted an experience uh, at a historically black college, and it was life-changing uh, being able to go to a, a college where there is mostly black students and black teachers. That was the first time I had ever experienced a black teacher. And so it helped define me. It helped me find myself. It helped me get grounded in culture. And, um, and I started to really feel comfortable in my own skin. I love that um, even though we're so far removed, we have a n large number of folks who understand the power of going to a HBCU and will um, offer their students a chance to go and experience and tour places like that. But it always stuck with me, and I knew that there was something that, there was something to that for me. Um, but it just allowed me to be able to, to, to sit in my skin differently and be proud of that and, and embrace it, even though I knew I was different than everybody that was around me but at the same time part of this big community village because those folks look just like me and those are the folks that embraced me. But my mom was a survivor. She always came up with whatever was needed. She made a way to find a way to get whatever was needed for the household. In many days my mom used to walk all the way from Southwest Portland, uh, which was off of Barber, off of Wood Street, between Barber Boulevard, walk all the way downtown, then tote them bags, you know, walking back home. She didn't even take a bus. And I had to stay at the house with the other kids, and I was young, and they didn't move unless they had to go to the bathroom. I actually ended up giving my own children the experience that I swore that I, I hated and I would never have because they were in Southwest and they were the only black kid in their classroom and they were the only black kid in their neighborhood. And so, you know, they grew up feeling a little out of place and, and it was just circumstances that, that caused that go, to go from generation to generation. And so when I moved them into Northeast, uh, they uh, became uh, much more uh, aware of uh, themselves and uh, having friends who looked like them and that kind of thing. And uh, I put my son, at the time he was in eighth grade, into Caranja Cruz's class when they had a boys' academy at Jefferson. Completely changed his life and, and it was just, it was an amazing experience. My dad, he just always had creative strategies. He, if you, you could ask him something and he literally, his mind just went to work on issues, solving and addressing issues. And so I think that's what I inherited from him is this creative strategies, this belief that um, there's a creative means to address some issue. What I remember about my dad is getting um, his lunch pail every time he would come home after work. I'd hear him coming up the driveway and I'd run out there and get his lunch pail. He always had something left in that lunch pail for me. I was raised by two parents and I think it devastated me when uh, my mom and dad split and it was hard on all of us, but I think I took it the hardest. I had a real mother and when I say a real mother, she was three something. You understand? And we talk about forearm. Mom was dropping forearms back in the 60s. You know, forearm smashes. And But she was involved in the community. That was just it. She was involved in the community. NAACP, Urban League, uh, of course, church. My mother's friends made me like I am now. Miss Washington, uh, Miss Dalworth, Mr. Dalworth, all the people that my mother that raised me hang around, and my mother, and my father. 
You see what I'm saying? A lot of people thought I was too strict. A lot of friends thought I was too strict. There was people always coming up, oh, your children are acting so uh, pro, and they, you don't want to give us money or, you know, reward us. But uh, my kids wasn't allowed to uh, stand up, you know, and pour sugar in the water and, and act all whatever. No, they got beat down, they know it. Um, we have a lot of parents that are trying to be their kids' friends versus being their parents. Because I was raised in the area of where you showed out is where you got woe out. And it didn't matter by who. It didn't have to be your parents. Back in the day, you couldn't talk back to them. You couldn't do it like you do now. Cause you got, you got a beating. Mama was very strict. Daddy didn't whoop us, but mama did. I never got a spanking from my dad other than from his mouth. He would use mine on you and make you cry. But mama, she tore up your butt. At the end of the day, you held your family name high. You represented your family, and if somebody knew who your family was and you was disrepresenting your family, yeah, that was, you'd have to pay for that. That's how it was back in the day. See? That's how I was brought up. Um, there was a barbecue, some kind of family gatherings. Um, people who actually were outside a whole lot more, just living and loving and barbecuing and, you know, playing Frisbee and uh, there wasn't a whole bunch of dogs around here like we got right now. And when you go along Williams in Vancouver now, it's, it's completely unrecognizable. It's one of the most unrecognizable parts of this city. I, I recently had lunch there the friend and it was it literally felt like I was in another city. Quite a bit of change has taken place in this area. Our community um, doesn't have the same number of gathering spaces. We certainly don't have the number of schools and um, things that were here. I don't know. Um, our community has changed. In Portland, you know, it's always been Portland such a largely white community, largely white city that um, that I it was easy for me to adjust, but it was also the same thing where I would seek out black folks. The usual typical success story is that a person living in the worst city in America, which is Camden as the dubious distinction of, will, f will get themselves out of uh, that situation by working really hard and rolling up their sleeves or applying their brain or getting real smart in school. And the, what you're supposed to do in that situation is, is go forward and never look back. And so very early on, I knew that was not the, the approach that I would use to form my direction in life. Even though many people in our community have been scattered all around, there's still a desire to gather. There's still ways that we're um, trying to do that. I do like social media for parts of that, but you can't replace that human touch. Those are the sacrifices I made. I tried to pick a house or a neighborhood that looked, a, looked like a place where you would want to raise your children and where you would you know, feel pride in being there. But that's not to say that I want to be in terrible neighborhoods either, you know. That's sort of the, the cry of a lot of black folks is that we shouldn't have to be in the worst neighborhoods in, in you know, surrounded by poverty and crime just to be around our own people. We shouldn't have to be in a dangerous place just to feel like we're in a safe place. People don't talk to each other anymore. They don't even know who their neighbors are. Let known like, go and be involved with them. Once we were a community, now, we have fences and, and property lines and, and people don't talk to each other anymore. So, so things have changed. I guess Portland is becoming a, a big city. One of the interesting things for me about living in Portland, having moved to Portland, I was in junior high, was that um, I explored it all the time. You know, I would just get, uh, hop on a bus and go to different neighborhoods and I would go to the movies and I would do all sorts of things. And, and the city really opened up to me. I had a sense of exploration. And, and as a result of that, um, I grew as, as, as a person 
and, and as an artist. And even at, you know, in, in junior high and high school, I was going out and I was meeting other young people that had similar interests that I had. And, and I never had that sort of thing growing up on the East Coast. It was in Portland, though, that I have done more things creatively than I have done in any other city. It's where I felt like I've opened up and blossomed as a creative artist. I'm a multilingual as an artist, I'm not really deep on any of those specific things in terms of my painting, poetry, writing plays or songs or any of that stuff. I think I just, um, I want to give flight to what's inside. I worked hard to learn what I learned about art. And one of the greatest joys for me is to pass that on. And an even greater joy is when I can pass that on to a person of color. And so that what made me like I am today. Like all those people now are gone. All of them, they're gone. But I never talked back to them. Never did. Bet not. When you lose a loved one, and especially a child, you always think about that. You think about, oh, maybe I shouldn't have did this, or, you know, what if I had did this? You know, you kind of regret some of the bad things that you feel bad about. But then, too, hopefully they'll thank you and say, well, Mom, you saved us. I guess I'll hear about that one day. <laughs> when I was much younger, I, I would have never thought that I would have had this statement. But I can't see myself living, actually, in any other city. Uh, I, I have invested a lot of time in Portland. I've defined who I am through my experiences and because of my work in Portland as a columnist uh, for the Oregonian and then as an artist and now as a teacher. So there's so many lives I think that I've touched and built a foundation of, of, of um, defining what my, I want my legacy to be, that I can't imagine living anywhere else. If it weren't for y'all, you know, at the Mad District and all that, doing what we were doing, we wouldn't be, no, they said, Jay, thank you. No, 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 it was y'all. And to everybody that was on Black Rock 88, it wasn't me, it was y'all wanting to dance. And that's one of the things that makes Portland so beautiful. We have a large artist community, and I would not trade that in for anything. I was raised around it, and so it's like to be able to put my fingers into this rich clay and come out with something, and it's just like, this from this mud, I am going to create anything that I want. In the museum, uh, one of the things I, I really responded to was a piece by uh, Hooks, and she said, you resist when you tell your story. We all have a story. We all can resist. We must resist. And I think that had I, had I lived in another city, I don't know if I would have turned out the way I did because there was, there was access to so many things in this city that, that I never had access to before. Everything was fairly close by whether it was museums or movie theaters or the library or, or you know, even Powell's books, which I discovered at a really young age. And, and all of that had played an integral role in shaping who I am, shaping the artist that I would become, the storyteller that I would become. And, and for, you know, not everything about Portland's great, but not everything about it's terrible either. And sometimes I have to remind myself of that, that, you know, the person I am today, I, I am this person, because of where I've lived the vast majority of my life. And, you know, I guess that's a beautiful thing. I'm glad my family moved to the Pacific Northwest. I did love the South. I moved to Houston later. I did love the South, um, but this is home for me.
Like sometimes it depends on who does it first, the kind that, that you do or you get. I don't think anyone really knows when it started. As a people, we've always came up with our own expressions. Isn't it different based off you know somebody? It's very subtle. Most people don't, don't know it, particularly other cultures. I first realized that it, it didn't happen amongst other groups. I'm originally from New York City, so we grew up and it was almost instinctual. Like I said, I, I'm not conscious of it, so it it's just happened on its own. I'm from the South, so we got a little bit different swag about ours. You never know, man. You could be just walking down the street and see somebody and just give it up. It's like, oh, m my brother, my sister, what's up? Well, you know, man, nod is a real fascinating thing, you know, <laughs> nod. The nod, it's been in our culture for hundreds of years. Whether it be in the United States or Africa, Europe, even, even examples in, in India. It was very commonplace where there were small numbers of black or African folks um, to acknowledge one another with the nod. When I was first conscious of the nod, it was probably when I was like five or six seeing my, uh, my dad and his friends do it. You may not always do it when you're really young, but as you get older, you understand why people speak to each other in, in a nonverbal way, and that is that nod. It's interesting being a black woman in Portland um, especially from not being out here. Um, being here feels like an invisible anomaly. It's funny, I laugh at some of my friends who are also from the East Coast, and we talk about like being there, and it's like, you know, remember those days when, you know, these guys would be catcalling and say, hey, yo, chocolate, and you know, hi, queen, and all this other stuff, and we'd be like, please don't talk to me. And now you're just like, oh my God, I can't wait to go back home for that that A.L. chocolate or like just that acknowledgement. If I see somebody who's more like my elder, uh, it is it is a down nod for sure. For me, if I nod at you with the heads up, that means I look up to you, I respect you as a man, as a person. If I nod at you with the head down, keep it pushing. And it don't have to be a long nod, that won't work. It's a perfectly timed. We don't need to know each other. We just need to affirm that we see you. And that's it. And it has to go no further than that. We don't have to say hi, bye, or none. It's just what's happening. Like, it's not one of those things that you got to, like, you know, I got to know your walk of life. You know, I may not want to meet you today. I may not want to shake your hand, but I do want to recognize you and say, I see you. Every time we see each other, um, we like to recognize one another. And the nod is one way to say that I see you. You, you exist. What is a nod? A nod to me is a self-expression and the expression of compassion and to me compassion is medicine now you don't walk around all day looking for somebody to give a nod to but when you encounter people and particularly now that we don't shake hands when I walk I always nod I speak to people and it makes me feel good and I'm sure it makes them feel good when you see a fellow brother out there that's going through what you're going through and you understand his struggle you may not know him but you're gonna give him the nod and, I, and in some ways, I'm kind of like an introspective person, a little reserved. So I feel like the down nod is more my style. My nod is, is this here. Hey. Hey. What's up? The other one, like that. Because sometimes I do look at people and I'm just like. My dad used to hit it like this. Me, I have several different nods, you know, for different women and, and men, all that kind of stuff. It depends so, because there's so many variations. There's like like the blackbirds and crows. Right, yeah. They, right. they, you might, it might sound like a ah! to you, but actually that ah! was a ah! you know. Right. To anybody else, it looked like just a nod, but little do you know. Yeah, yeah. yes, like okay, something's happening. Yeah, there's like mm -hmm, yeah. that kind of nod, and then there's more of like the sober nod. Then there's like the smiling nod, you know, it's so many nods. And then there's a nod in the car when people ride by people and they smile and smirk at you and kind of, yeah, look at me nod. Yeah, growing up in uh, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana and being around the head nods, when I asked my grandfather and a few of those uncles, 
Um, the way they explained it was that um, during slavery, it was one of those early kind of communications where there was no, no language. I was about 20 years old. I was stationed in Spokane, Washington. I went to Seattle, Tacoma, to visit. I'm walking down the street. This elderly gentleman, probably about 70, 80 years old, was sitting in front of a grocery store, just sitting there. And I walked by and I nodded at him and he nodded at me. And as I went by, he said, hold on, young man, come here a minute. I said, yes, sir. He said, are you related to Owens? I said, that's my great grandfather. He says, well, you walk just like him. So I can look back and say that if I had not nodded at him, I probably would have never known that my grandfather was in this part of the country uh, working in a coal mine over in Roslyn, Washington. Oh, my Nas story. So, okay, oh, you, you want to hear the Nas story for today? I was in the Pearl District, and there's no brothers around there, man. And as I'm crossing this intersection, this four-way intersection, this brother is pulling up to the uh, stoplight. And I don't know why, but out the side of my vision, I just looked and, you know, we gave each other a nod, and it was just... One of my really close friends now, how we became, how we started becoming cool, um, I would always see him downtown and like didn't know him from anywhere. I think I'd like seen him around, maybe work. And like every single time I would see him, he would always just acknowledge whether it was a head nod, normally it was like a hi, how you doing? Or it was some sort of something. Um, and that meant everything. Let me see that nod. <laughs> that was hard to do. Okay, so it's the actual. Okay, it's the actual one. Okay, let me see here. Oh man. Okay, I gotta do it to the camera. And one more time. Your nod. Let me see it. That's my nod. That's it. <laughs> okay. Okay, I can do this. Okay. Ah. Uh. I'm from Ghana and. Uh, uh, in Ghana, we have that, that greeting which says, I see you, me now ko. In the African culture, the nod is basically the same as it is in the African American culture, and it's a sense of, hey, when I see you, you're, I recognize your presence, I see you, I acknowledge you, and it's just kind of a check-in that we do with each other. Well, when I arrived here from Los Angeles. When I came to Oregon. So when I first moved to Portland. I got here about a year ago. I did see that I was from a much more diverse place. As you know, Oregon doesn't have a lot of black people. One of the things that I found really interesting was that if I'm on the bus or like just walking into the mall. Walking along the beach here in Portland, Oregon. Where there aren't that many of us. So the first time I saw a black person walking down the street. I saw another brother approaching me. He was about 100 yards away and I'm walking around. When you saw another person who was black, the hello is imperative. And I knew for certain that the universal nod was going to come into play. You expected to have that connection. I saw him eye to eye, soul to soul. I was like, hey. <laughs> and then as you walk past him, you say hello. You know, you would do that little nod. And as I threw in the nod, and he see me. And I'm like, hey, what's up? You know, and just a little head nod. And they did not acknowledge me back. And then you don't get it back. And? and I'd get nothing. He left me hanging. It's as if you don't see me. And when I haven't gotten it back a few times. As if you have assassinated me. I didn't know how to respond. I was somewhat shocked. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I had encountered the elusive sand brother. So look here, if you ever encounter a sand brother and they leave you hanging like a high five, don't worry about it. Just remember, they've got sand in their eye and they can't see it right. I could actually feel how positive they are as a black person toward another black person. And uh, that always kind of leaves a kind of a funky feeling, you know. And they don't nod or they turn away. In fact, they kind of looked away. The, the <laughs> I've seen that here. My experience here in Portland is that we're a small black community and so we all know each other, and so we often nod and hug and smile. I've experienced like being in other cities and like I'm smiling and nodding at them and like they're not paying me any attention often. Um, and so like I often wonder if some of it has to do with, um, you know, with where you're from and being more comfortable with people who you know. Uh, when I don't get the nod, 
That's usually a sign of uh, they don't recognize the struggle. Black men generally won't do, won't uh, reciprocate with the black nod, especially if they're part of an interracial couple. It's like, I'm not with you. I'm not with you guys. One time I was walking and I passed by like a few black men, didn't even look my way, no acknowledgement, no anything. And like, I was really pissed and annoyed. And I remember like seeing him like a few blocks away and I'm like, I purposely need to cross the street because I just need to be seen at this moment in time. And sure enough, as I got to him, it was that same like, hey, what's up? Like, you know, head nod. It just meant so much. I remember when I was a youngster, all the men used to wear hats, and they used to tip the brim of the hat and kind of nod their head at women, especially. This is pretty exclusive to African-American men. Uh, if you nod to a woman, uh, that's not that, not that well received. Uh, you might not do it to elders, you might not do it to children, you might not even do it cross-gender, but if you encounter another brother your age or contemporary, you give them the hello. I'll always say something. I'll say like, hey, we're, we're here in Portland. Do you see any of us around? No, it's just you and I. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna give you the nod. But I notice whenever I'm running up against another bull, like myself, I tend to, you know, raise my head. I have a friend who, whose partner um, is a black man, and she says even when she's walking by herself, she doesn't, she doesn't get like that sort of, just that same sort of love or just acknowledgement that you're seen. And she said whenever she's with him, that's when like other black men would acknowledge him and still would never like just at least acknowledge her. You know, coming to a place where you don't really feel seen for like your black femininity, for being a black woman here, um, it means a lot. So, you know, if you're a black man, please head nod or just acknowledge, you know, black women here. I went to Lincoln High School and the black population there was extremely small. So like you could literally be the only black student in your classroom and everyone's looking at you um, when black issues come up or you're in history class and things come up, they're looking at you to be the affirmation or the answer. So when you're walking the hallways after class, you feel kind of staggered and low energy. And then when you see a fellow brother and he give you the head nod, he's letting you know that, hey, I see you, bro. I know that, you know, you're going through it, but hey, we here, we out here. When I see um, a student um, 
standing up for themselves to a teacher or to a, another individual that's their classmate. I see them and I give them like a headline, like, yeah, I see you. It's that one, well again, when I look at them from one athlete to another, I go, yeah. I do hope that the nod is passed down. Uh, it, it's important, it keeps us connected. We are so individualized now that we're so into our phones and whatnot that we don't even say hello or like see that we see another brother and give him a head nod. And I want, I want to bring it back. and I was over in the St. John's area and I'm walking around. Uh, I passed the security dude, he's right outside of this bar. Head nod, he head nods back. I keep walking and I get like to the corner and I'm thinking to myself like, that brother just nodded back to me. So I look back and he was still looking at me. So I walk back over and I was like, hey brother, where you from? He's like, I'm from Milwaukee. And I was like, ah, okay. And he goes, you ain't from around here either. And I was like, no, why do you, why do you ask? And he's like, Nobody around here says what's up to me. I stand here every night. And I was like, we gotta change that, man. We gotta get that head and eye back. That's our people. That's my nod, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay, I can do this. Ooh, how do I do this? Hey, now I'm all awkward. Ooh, 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 you got some strains. Got some strains. There's some inappropriate gestures, but uh, those are reserved for special occasions. Till we meet again, keep this nod between us. <laughs>